Hello and welcome to We On Live, broadcast from London. I'm Ollie Barrett and these are the headlines. I do accept we should have laid the ground better. But there is, I there, do there, accept that. You accept you should have I, laid I, the ground I better. And I have learned from that. The Liz Truss government announces a dramatic U-turn on a tax cut unveiled as part of a controversial economic package. In a major breakthrough, Ukrainian forces recapture villages along the Dnipro River in southern Ukraine, opening a second big front, forcing Moscow to abandon ground just days after claiming to annex it. Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei accuses the United States and Israel of inciting unrest in the Islamic Republic following the death of Masa Amini. The Israeli military installs a remote-controlled weapon at checkpoints in the West Bank which it says fires non-lethal projectiles in response to Palestinian unrest. Inflation in Turkey jumps to a new 24-year high, exceeding 83% in September, as President Erdogan presses for more interest rate cuts despite surging prices. In a humiliating U-turn, the UK government has been forced to abandon its plan to abolish the 45% top rate of income tax. It comes after a growing Conservative Party revolt over the policy and turbulent reaction from the markets. We're absolutely listening uh, to them. I think it's really important actually that people uh, who hold office aren't just uh, sticking their heads in the sand but are listening to the, the wider conversation and that's why uh, we decided not uh, to, uh, to proceed with the abolition of the rate, the 45p rate, and we, we're, we're not doing that. And we're listening. And I'm not going to. Uh, what I'm focused on now is delivering the growth plan, making sure that the energy intervention works for people, making sure that it works for businesses, making sure that people get to keep more uh, of their hard earned money. The so called mini budget, which contained the planned abolition of the top rate of tax, triggered a series of problems for the Liz Truss government. In the days after it was revealed, the pound hit a record low against the US dollar before recovering. The Bank of England had to intervene last week with a $73 billion program to shore up markets. Liz Truss has admitted communication errors in how the economic package was presented. Several Conservative MPs were threatening not to vote for the removal of the top rate of tax. The government insists it is pressing ahead with the rest of the plan. The average family will be about £430 a year better off and we're going to get Britain's economy growing, which ultimately will generate more tax revenues to pay for public services, see wages rising and see the jobs of the future getting cre uh, created. No, actually, you might have a desire to do something. And by the way, I share their desire. I want lower taxes across the econ economy. But I also understand that, first of all, we have to have the economy moving. We have to make sure that we're protecting people from these high energy costs as they're doing and so much else. London correspondent Alex Isaac reports now. The 
45 uh, p tax turn is a really big deal because a lot of people have been complaining about it, saying that people over 150 thousand pounds are earning that much. They don't really need these cuts, and these cuts do need to come down not just through the economic trickle, but it actually needs to help the people that are on lower and um, middle wages too. However, it does seem that the distraction comment is, is also quite relevant because they are still borrowing millions, billions of pounds to help the, the country to try and get through this energy crisis that we are having now and we are going to be having for the foreseeable future. And some of that billions is going towards companies that are already in huge profits just to help us cap our bills. So there is a lot more conversation to be had to exactly why we're still borrowing these billions of money, uh, billions of pounds to give this money to people that potentially don't actually require it. And maybe there's some more austerity cuts are needed where Liz trusted that she wouldn't do that when she was in her hustings. So it'd be interesting to see how they go from here. Rishi Sunak said when he talks about the hustings that Liz uh, Trust was flip-flopping and a lot of people have used that term for her even back then when she was trying to win that leadership con contest. So it does seem that many of her policies aren't necessarily hardened and they're going to go forward. I think what is a, a positive that we've seen is that maybe she's trying to, to listen and maybe she does have a good advisor that is going to be able to come over and say, look, actually, these policies aren't going to work in the long term. Well, let's talk now to market analyst Susanna Streeter, who joins me live. Susanna, what's the market reaction been so far to this move from the government? Well, certainly in terms of the pound, what we saw is a brief jump in sterling, uh, just as rumours swirled that this was indeed going to happen, that there would be this big U-turn on the 45 pence tax rate. And so you saw the pound uh, jump above uh, $1.12, but then some of that bounce uh, it retreated from that. I think because this is just yet another political upset for the UK and certainly the FTSE 100 um, that's trading lower uh, as well today. So we did see a bounce in the pound, uh, but some of those gains have now been lost and there is still a lot of uncertainty because, of course, this reversal, this U-turn, it, it covers around two billion pounds worth of tax cuts. And in total, the tax cut package is around 45 billion. So there are still lots of unfunded tax cuts still on the table. And that's why you haven't seen government, UK government borrowing costs. So uh, UK gilt yields fall that dramatically. They've certainly fallen back. Uh, but remember as well, the Bank of England is buying uh, gilts and buying these government bonds uh, to try and calm the market. So there's that effect still being felt as well. And Susanna, in, in the days since the pound hit that record low against the US dollar, the government, we've heard it from the prime minister, we've heard it from the chancellor and other ministers as well, have been blaming the market turmoil essentially on Vladimir Putin and the war in Ukraine and in, insisting it wasn't actually to do with uh, Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget. How credible a position is that? Well, certainly, you, you just got to look at the charts and you can see that sterling plunged after that mini budget was unveiled and then has recovered uh, since the Bank of England has taken this action. Now, it's taken action, certainly, which has helped lower borrowing costs, government borrowing costs a little bit. But at the same time, uh, the Bank of England has said that it's not going to hesitate in increasing interest rates. And that's why you've seen um, expectations, market expectations for um, the uh, benchmark interest rate here in the UK to rise to around 5.5%. Now, just a couple of days ago, um, before this most recent reversal, the expectation was that interest rates could rise up to 6%. So that's lowered a little bit, but it's still high. And that means that um, it's going to be much more expensive for um, homeowners to get extra loans, uh, to move house. It's likely to affect the housing market, but also um, corporate bond yields have risen as well. So it's more expensive for companies to borrow on the markets right now. And that will affect investment in uh, the years to come. And of course, the government is all about a growth agenda. But the problem is, by the falling 
due to the falling pound, imports are becoming more expensive and borrowing costs are also higher. So it's going to be very difficult to stimulate growth because of the approach that they've taken. OK, Susanna, thank you. That's Susanna Street, a market analyst joining me live from Bristol. Ukraine claims it is in full control of Russia's eastern logistics hub at Lehman. It's one of the most significant battlefield gains in weeks for Ukraine. Ukrainian forces are reportedly recapturing towns along the West Banks in southern Ukraine. According to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, Ukraine's capture of a city within territory of Putin's declared annexations demonstrates Kiev's progress. Russia says its troops had withdrawn from Lehman to avoid being surrounded by Ukraine's army. The Russian Defense Ministry has shared videos of recruits training in Russia and in Russia-controlled regions of Ukraine. According to the ministry, the units staffed by mobilized personnel and volunteers are taking part in intensive combat training. Well, friends, everything is surprisingly under control in the direction of Kherson, despite everything that is happening. The Nazis have broken through a little deeper, but our defense system is working. No matter what anyone says, we are on the territory of the Kherson region without panic. The Antonvika bridge is behind me and everything is fine. Meanwhile, Germany is set to deliver the first of four advanced IRIS-T air defense systems to Ukraine. This is designed to boost Ukraine's capability to ward off drone attacks. On Friday, EU leaders are set to discuss how to step up support for Ukraine and ways to tame soaring energy prices. In Brazil's election, incumbent President Jair Bolsonaro and former President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva failed to hit the 50% mark. There will now be a runoff vote on the 30th of October between the two. The election commission says Lula scored 47.5% of the votes. Bolsonaro came a close second with 43.7%, a tighter result than polls had predicted. I understand it was a vote for change for the people, but there are certain changes that could be worse. We tried to show this in the campaign, but that didn't reach to part of the population. We will analyze it. Bolsonaro, a far-right leader and the current president, retains the backing of his so-called Bibles, Bullets and Beef base. There was a dip in his popularity due to the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, the struggling economy and deforestation in the Amazon. Bolsonaro alleges Brazil's electronic voting system is plagued by fraud. His opponent, Lula da Silva, has vowed to fight all the way to victory. He is seeking to stage a return after spending four years in jail on controversial corruption charges. He's promised to increase protection measures for the Amazon, to resume multinational, multilateral international policy, and says he will eradicate hunger. A massive crackdown in Iran continues against protests triggered by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in police custody. 
Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has broken silence on the uprising. Khamenei has accused arch foes the United States and Israel of fomenting unrest in the Islamic Republic following the death of the Kurdish woman. Giving a strong backing to the security forces confronting protesters, the Iranian Supreme Leader said the demonstrations were orchestrated and not the actions of ordinary Iranians. Iranian security forces have continued their crackdown on students protesting at a top Tehran university. Riot police have fired tear gas to disperse students from the campus. Gunfire could be heard in videos posted on social media. Around 200 students took part in the protest at the university and dozens were reportedly arrested. Students organized protests in various universities across Iran. Classes have been suspended and moved online at the Tehran University and security has been heightened. Protests across the country haven't slowed despite the police crackdown. The Iran Human Rights Organization says at least 133 people have been killed in protests across Iran. Iranian authorities have not released an official death toll but claim many security personnel have been killed by rioters. Thousands have marched in Paris to condemn Iran's Islamic leadership. There have been widespread protests also seen in Rome, Zurich, London, Seoul, Auckland and Budapest. Meanwhile, Germany, France, Denmark, Spain, Italy and the Czech Republic have proposed sanctions targeted towards people and organizations responsible for the crackdown on protests in Iran. EU foreign ministers are to discuss the proposals at a meeting later this month. Indonesia has set up an independent team to investigate the stampede at a football stadium that left 125 people dead, including 32 children. On Sunday, police used tear gas to try and quell a pitch invasion that escalated into one of the world's worst stadium disasters. Hundreds attended a vigil in the Indonesian capital, Jakarta, on Sunday night, a day after a deadly crowd crush at a football event. Authorities say at least 125 people were killed in what's become one of the world's worst stadium disasters. Mourners gathered outside the gates of the stadium to lay flowers for the victims. People also lit candles beside a lion statue, the symbol of local football club Arema FC. 30-year-old Choi Rul Muslimin, who was at the game on Saturday night, said he was able to escape through the VIP gate. The tragedy unfolded on Saturday in Malang, in the province of East Java, after home side Arema lost 3-2 to Persebaya, Surabaya. East Java police chief Nico Afinta said frustrated Arema supporters invaded the pitch, damaging police vehicles and attacking officers. Officers responded by firing tear gas in an attempt to control the situation, triggering the crush and cases of suffocation. 15-year-old Ahmad Kayo and his brother, 14-year-old Mohamed Farrell, were among those killed. Relatives of the two boys held a funeral on Sunday, where they were laid to rest in adjacent graves. 17 children are among those who died. Condolences have poured in from around the world for the stadium victims, from the Pope in the Vatican to Gianni Infantino, the president of World Soccer's governing body, FIFA. Together with FIFA and the global football community, all our thoughts and prayers are with the victims, those who have been injured, together with the people of Indonesia, the Asian Football Confederation and the entire Indonesian football community at this difficult time. FIFA specifies in its safety regulations that no firearms or crowd control gas should be carried or used by stewards or police. East Java police did not respond to a request for comment on whether they were aware of those regulations. Indonesian President Joko Widodo ordered the Football Association of Indonesia to suspend all games in the Indonesian top league until an investigation had been completed. Arema on Monday apologized to the victims, with its president stating he was ready to take full responsibility for the events. 
Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is promising to take steps to reduce the impact of soaring electricity bills. He's also pledging to maximize the benefits to the economy from a weak yen. We will strongly promote policy measures to maximize the benefits of the weak yen and to give back to the Japanese people. Starting from the 11th of this month, we will revive inbound tourism by bringing back visa-free travelers and individual travelers to achieve a target of having foreign visitors spend over 5 trillion yen. Kishida was giving a speech opening Japan's parliamentary session and he also promised to help victims of the Unification Church's allegedly fraudulent businesses and huge donation collection. We take the various opinions we receive from the public very seriously and will put them to good use going forward. In addition, I squarely face the people's voices regarding our relationship with the Unification Church, fulfill our accountability and take various measures to restore trust. Kishida is under pressure after a widening scandal exposed decades of close ties between former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, his ruling Liberal Democratic Party and the Unification Church. An extract from 35 minutes of footage of the Beatles 1966 Japan tour has been released following a fierce court battle. The black and white footage is from the British band's only visit to the country in 1966. It was recorded by police as a security measure. I'll leave you with that story. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.